Well, as Dr. Isaacs mentioned at the beginning, Monday is Reformation Day, this Sunday, Reformation Sunday. I know that many of you probably come from church traditions where that is not even mentioned uh, when we get near that period. As a matter of fact, uh, in some churches, probably there's more mention of Halloween than there is uh, Reformation Sunday. In parts of uh, Germany, it, would, it is actually a holiday, five states of Germany, I believe, so that if you lived in that, those parts, and we have several students from Germany this year, uh, if you lived there, uh, it would be a holiday with a day off. You wouldn't have school. You wouldn't have to go to work. And as a matter of fact, I discovered that Chile, since 2009, actually makes it a national holiday. Reformation Day is a national holiday in the country of Chile. Next year, 2017, marks the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 500 years ago that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. Big celebrations all over the world are being planned. And in the midst of all of this hoopla, if we can call it that, many are asking, and perhaps some of us ask the question, is the Reformation still relevant. The Protestant Reformation, of course, was a reaction to a Roman church that has since made substantial changes. This was a protest in light of abuses of that time. But perhaps our own time is so different that the Reformation is merely bygone history. The story of it, of course, goes something like this. By the 16th century, the church was in sad shape. There was lots of corruption. And yet, despite the corruption, many people assumed they were good enough to merit salvation. The Bible was there, but most didn't know it. It was often secondary to, to, to traditions and what human beings said was right and good. Most people in that era thought that because they had priests who did all the spiritual work, there was very little they needed to do, and they certainly did not need to be spiritually vigilant in the way that we might think today. Well, it was into that ethos and into that spiritual vacuum that God raised up leaders to bring change, to call the church to repentance, and to call the church back to the designs of God. People like Luther, like John Calvin, Folks like Melanchthon, Zwingli, Menno Simons, and others could be added to the list. All of them, of course, were fallible human beings. They didn't always agree on things, to be sure. And they did and said some things we wish they hadn't. But God, nonetheless, greatly used them in bringing about a great renewal of the church which came to be understood as dubbed the Protestant Reformation. And so on this Reformation week and in the coming of the 500th anniversary, though we are in a different setting with some different issues, I want to suggest to us this morning that the Reformation is still relevant. That what the Reformers, all of them, despite their differences, talked about is highly relevant for the church and relevant for personal life. Relevant because they are biblical. And so this morning, I want to reflect on three significant themes that come out of the Protestant Reformation that is true no matter what the denominational background, Presbyterian, Baptist, Anglican, Lutheran, Charismatic, Anabaptist, Independent, and all of the others that we could throw into the mix. Three themes that I think all of us need and the church desperately needs in the 21st century. Now, on a footnote, I wanted to say this is a topical sermon this morning. I couldn't find a text on the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> and preaching a topical sermon, I'm reminded of the words of my predecessor, Dr. Walter Kaiser, who served as president from 97 to 2006. I had Dr. Kaiser as an Old Testament professor when I was a student in seminary, and he would often say, and some of you, the faculty who've been around here for a long time, know many of his sayings and lots of his jokes, 
But he would often say, I heard him say it in every class I took with him, always preach expository sermons. You can sin once a year and preach a topical sermon. <laughs> Today is my sin. I hope Dr. Kaiser will absolve me of it. Three themes from the Reformation important for us today. Number one, the authority of God's word. Christians historically have affirmed, and the Reformation reemphasized, that God is a speaking God. A God who reveals himself in visible, clear ways to humanity. At creation, for example, he speaks the universe into being, and God said, and God said, and God said, repeated nine times. He spoke through the prophets of old. He spoke through the incarnation when God took on human flesh and came and lived among us. He spoke through the apostolic witness. God is a speaking God. Let's be sure we know that God has revealed things to humankind in general ways. Through the creation he has made, through human reason, through human experience and the rest. But God has clearly spoken definitively in the incarnate word and the written word. That written word, of course, came through various human writers writing in their own style varying genre, vastly different context, utilizing diverse themes, but under the providence of God, coming to us in such a way that God has revealed his purposes and his plans for humanity. He's revealed the great cosmic story of creation, fall, redemption, and a final restoration. He has revealed in the word the implications of that story for the life of followers of Christ and for the church. And therefore, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, says this about the word. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Or this text from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, it is precisely because the Bible is God's truthful word that it is the ultimate authority for how we think and for how we live. We learn from tradition, we learn from our heritage, but they're secondary to the Bible. We learn from other academic disciplines. We can learn a great deal from psychology and sociology and history and the sciences and philosophy and management studies and all the rest. Don't fear them, learn from them. But because the Bible is God's word, it is the final, trustworthy, truthful, unfailing authority for our lives and for our thinking. And thus, when the church has debates, as it inevitably does, the first question we must always ask is, what does God's word say? And when you personally wrestle with questions in your own life, the first step must always be to the word. We know, of course, there are varying interpretations in Protestantism particularly, all kinds of differing interpretations of given texts. But because it is the word of God, we go back again and again and again to the text to let it speak to us. But the Bible, the word is more than a revelation to get our thinking and lives straight. It's important to recognize that it's a living word. A living word, meaning it is a nurturing word, a comforting word, an empowering word. Some of you perhaps recall that five years ago there was a commemoration of 9-11 held in New York City on the 10th anniversary 
of that time when the jets drove into the Twin Towers and destroyed them and hundreds of people were killed and injured. The, the great controversy at that time in 2011 was that the commemoration was to have no religious themes or religious dimensions to it. It was to be a secular service of remembrance. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, was invited to come and to speak on this occasion. He stood up to speak, and these were his opening words taken from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. On that day, there were many other words spoken to help people come to grips with that great tragedy of 9-11. But I'm quite convinced that none could match the comfort, the strength, and the power of those words. Not because they are beautiful poetry, which they are, but simply because they are the word of the living triune God. The Reformation rightly restored the Bible as the ultimate authority. Even when people do not acknowledge it, even in the midst of what is to be a secular occasion, it has the power to speak to the core of who we are as human beings. It's very easy for us in seminary to allow that word to become another academic text. It is very easy for all of us to say, yes, it is my authority, but it is simply an exercise in trying to understand the word in its specific detail and not allow that word to grip us and change us and mold us. And one of the great gifts of the Protestant Reformation, which the church desperately needs today, and you and I need in our lives, is that this word is a living, powerful word that shapes and molds us. It is to its pages we go again and again amidst the struggles and challenges of life. There was a second theme out of the Protestant Reformation that I think is very important for us today. It is the centrality of the cross. The Reformation traditions in all shapes, colors, and styles, from liturgical to charismatic, infant Baptists to adult believers, Baptists and Anabaptists, Calvinists to Arminians, high church to low church. You can run the gamut, all of them historically affirmed that salvation comes through the work of Christ on the cross alone. Solely by God's grace, solely by faith in Christ, are humans saved. And so the passage, which we heard a few moments ago from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here, all this is from God who reconciles us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Scripture, of course, is filled with very rich metaphors to describe what Christ did and what he accomplished on the cross. 
Words like justification, redemption, regeneration, reconciliation, healing, salvation, cleansing. But all point back to the work of the cross of Christ that forgives our sin and makes us right with the living God. The cross of Jesus presupposes two things. On the one hand, it presupposes something about humanity. Namely, that in our fallen state, we are in need of redemption, and there's absolutely nothing we can do within ourselves to earn it or to somehow appease God. And the second thing that the cross presupposes is something about Christ, that he is the eternal son of God, fully God, fully human, and that his death on the cross was not a martyrdom for a cause, but a sacrifice for human sin, wherein he does for us what nothing in the world could ever do for us and we can never do for ourselves. Now, this is important to reemphasize, particularly in a time when many assume that God somehow needs our help. Some of us were rather alarmed by a recent survey of evangelicals that came out on a number of very essential kind of core traditional beliefs of Orthodox Christianity. 50% of people who claim to be evangelical Christians in the United States agreed with this statement, 50%. An individual must contribute his or her own effort for personal salvation. Scripture is clear. There is nothing humans can do within themselves to merit God's saving grace. Well, no wonder the cross has long been an offense to the sensibilities of men and women. It's viewed by some and even viewed by some who write about the atonement to be barbaric, senseless, violent, exclusivistic. And indeed, if you were living in the first century, and you were going to start a religion, the last thing that would ever cross your mind would be bringing salvation by a cross of one who was despised and rejected by humanity. I think that's part of what makes it true. It's so at odds with our natural assumptions. It goes contrary to the way we would put it all together. And it is precisely the foolishness of the cross through which we experience salvation. And it is in the foolishness of the cross of Christ that we find true and lasting wisdom. The reformers all emphasize that. I remind us, however, that the cross of Christ is not just a fire escape from judgment, the way some may put it. It is not merely a judicial act that makes us right with God. It is the cross that also transforms us. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, the old is gone, the new is here, precisely because of the work of the cross. And it is also the cross that we are now called to take up and follow daily in our lives. As Bonhoeffer put it in The Cost of Discipleship, when Christ calls a person, he bids them come and die. Biblical Christians are a people of the cross, both for salvation and for our daily life. It is the theme for the Reformation, from the Reformation, and it is one we so desperately need today. But there's a third theme that comes out of the Reformation that I think is also significant for our time. It is the priesthood of all believers. In the medieval church before the Reformation, priests were viewed as the mediators between humans and Christ. They were the most important element of the church. They had ultimate responsibility. And reformers like Luther and Calvin argued from scripture that Christ is our ultimate priest, our high priest, there is no need for a special class of priests who have mediating power. Rather, all believers are priests who have access to God through Christ. 
All believers are responsible to live holy lives of service to Christ and humanity. All believers could read the Bible for themselves and be nurtured by it, though clearly there are gifts of teaching and gifts of pastorate. All believers are called to live out the faith in daily life where God has placed them. The concept was rooted in texts like Exodus 19.6, where Israel is described as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Peter picks up that language in 1 Peter chapter 2, when he says, verses, verse 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This was the calling, it was understood at the Protestant Reformation, this was the calling and the responsibility of all believers. None were off the hook. It related to clergy and laity alike. Whatever our calling in life, it was a calling of God. The notion of the priesthood reminds me of a story of two little boys who were out playing one day and they got into an argument over religion. And the one little boy argued that his religion was superior because they had pastors, not priests. And the other boy argued, no, his religion was superior because they had priests, not pastors. Well, the first little boy went home and told his parents about this debate that they were having. And they tried to explain to him that as they understood scripture, all believers are priests with access to God and a responsibility to God. Next day, the two little boys were out playing, and the first little boy said to the other, he said, look, you think you're hot because you have priests? He said, that's nothing. I am a priest. <laughs> well, he got it right. The Reformers renewed that biblical idea that we as believers are a holy nation, a holy priesthood, not only with access to God through Christ, but responsibility to live out our faith daily according to God's word, motivated by divine grace. That we are all called to bear witness to the reality of Christ, or as Luther once put it, we are to be little Christ to our neighbors. All of us daily should come to Christ in prayer and scripture. And together as a church, we are a royal priesthood declaring the praises of God who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so it really doesn't matter what you're called to. And I know that some of you are still in the discerning process. Some of you come to seminary to try to figure out what God has called you into in the days ahead. But it's important to internalize this truth. You will not be more effective for Christ, and you will not be nearer to Christ because you go into the pastorate, or because you go into the mission field, or because you, because you go into some other particular calling. The calling of Christ is to all people. It is the same, to walk with him, to live for him, to experience him in our lives. Calling to places of service is important, and I hope God calls lots of you into the pastorate and to the mission field, as well as into counseling, into teaching, and other places. But what is most important for us to recognize and remember, personally while we're in seminary, and what is important for the church to remember that was so rightly restored by the Reformation, was that all of us are priests called to come to God daily and to live out his ways in the midst of a broken world. Well, this week, next year, we remember a historic event. I suppose for most people, it's merely that, a historic event. But I really do believe the Reformation has lessons that are ongoing and has great relevance for us today. The authority of God's word, it is supreme in determining what we believe and everything we do 
and it is a living, powerful word. The centrality of the, cro of cro of the cross, the only way to God and salvation, and our task in daily life, and the priesthood of all believers, all of us are called to a life of holiness and responsibility before God. But it is interesting when the church and when believers follow these biblical themes, they really do make a great impact. They can reform the church as they did in the 16th century. They can renew our lives. They can make an impact on the world around us. We follow these themes not because they are a heritage or a tradition. We follow them because they form the heart of our Christian faith because they are right and true and good because then because they are what God's word teaches us. And so yes, the Reformation is still relevant. It brought theological renewal, personal renewal, church renewal, and it can do so today. For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy through Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.